Good morning. <clears throat> a blessing to see all of you here this morning. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting as we're doing this transition um, and trying to, to gauge how, how to uh, do it with numbers and, and stuff. So we're just bear with us over the coming months. We're doing a three-month trial on this to see how this works with the two services. Um, but our, our goal is really to try to, to um, be able to have everybody sitting either here in the sanctuary or in the gym so that we're not spread throughout the building. And, uh, and I do think that'll work out even here. I see there's still room here, which is good. And uh, we had still room in the 9 a.m. service as well. And so we're looking forward to how that will all work. Um, and by any means, if anyone has feedback about the, the new services and you have a suggestion or, I, or an idea somewhere, we're open to that as well. Um, but anyways, as uh, we start the service here this morning, um, just want to uh, greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus and uh, want to wish you a new, happy new year. Um, this is the first service of the new year and I think this is good for us to, to even reflect on that and kind of think about, well, what is this new year going to bring? What does 2024 look like in your life? Are you excited about the new year? Excited about where things are going to go? In order to be excited, maybe you got to turn off the news, Right? Anybody with me on that? You know, there's, uh, if you look to the news, media, um, often it's quite depressing, often it's not very encouraging, and because there's a lot of negativity, right? And, uh, you know, but we also live in a, in a time in, in, in the world where we do need to be serious. We need to consider and contemplate where, where is our economy going? What, what does it look like in, the, in this coming year? Um, something else that we're seeing as a crisis in our world, is, is we're facing um, a lot of different war on different fronts in our world today. Um, and, you know, we know that this goes, goes exactly in place to what Jesus talked about um, in Matthew 24 and 25 when he said that there's signs of his coming. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking around in... One of the things, too, that I've been doing some study on this recently and, and been just um, thinking about when, when Jesus said that it will be like the days of Noah. Do you ever think about that? You know, where there was the thoughts and the hearts of ma mankind was only evil continually. You know, in, in our world today, too, as you look around you, you see the evil intentions of our world and of our you know, public education system, all these kinds of things. You know, we see that there's, there's an agenda. And, and, and yet, in the midst of that, as a believer, uh, when we hear war, uh, rumors of wars, Jesus tells us not to be alarmed. Why? Because as a believer, our destiny isn't here. Our future is in heaven. So we can, with peace in our heart, we don't need to wring our hands and think, oh, what's, what's going to happen to me? Like where, you know, where are things going to... We can be fully confident that Jesus has everything in control. In fact, in Matthew 6, the end of the chapter, he says, we don't need to be anxious about anything. And he says there that, look at your heavenly Father. He, he takes care of the birds and the flowers in the field. And he says, he knows your needs. So seek his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to us. We don't need to worry. And so we can be fully confident that God is in charge. <clears throat> One of the, the things that I, I realize that, that um, many people deal with in the beginning of a new year, which can be a good thing. Maybe some of you here have worked on a New Year's resolution. How many of you here have a New Year's resolution? Anybody? Brave enough? Yeah? Somebody? There's a few of you. You know, in, in some ways, New Year's resolutions have become a bit of a taboo, right? Because, because we're, we all know people that have these resolutions and never do anything about them, right? They never fulfill them. And, you know, I was, I was reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and, and even um, last Sunday when I was preaching on Philippians chapter 3, um, Paul very clearly had a resolution in his mind. Maybe it wasn't a New Year's resolution, but it was a resolution. 
And his resolution was, he had a goal that he was looking for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This was his goal in life, um, to know him, to experience him more fully. And, And so there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you know, sometimes when we see people making New Year's resolutions, we kind of laugh at them and we kind of think, oh, you know, you're, you're never going to fulfill those things. And we kind of mock people. And then we go the other way and we don't have any goals in life. We don't do anything about it. And that's, I think that's equally problematic when, <clears throat> when we, and actually it's probably much worse, when we go through life aimlessly and purposelessly. Where, where there's nothing really, you know, we kind of let life dictate to us how we ought to live. We let circumstances that come our way um, reveal to us how we ought to live, rather than purposely, intentionally living. And that's kind of, kind of what I want to talk to you about here this morning, about being intentional in, in our faith. Because there's too many too many believers or Christians or, you know, in, in our churches today who have just kind of, you know, just kind of let go and just live however life dictates circumstances to them. And there, there's something very wrong with that for the believer. There's something very unbiblical for, uh, for the Christian when, when they're not purposely, intentionally, uh, with motivation for Christ making goals and directions in their life. There's something, there's something wrong with our faith. And I think it's good at the beginning of the year sometimes to, to say, where, where is my faith at? What am I doing with my faith? And so I want to go into 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you have your Bibles there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, starting at verse 24. And I want to read um, the first, or the four, the four verses there in that section. Verse 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You know, as we, as we look at this passage here, I want us to consider this first part. So Paul says, so run that you may obtain it. So run that you may obtain it. Obtain what? The prize, Right? So keep your eyes fixed on the prize and notice, I want you to notice this about this verse because I I realize that in the Christian faith, after people become saved, sometimes your motivation and purpose kind of diminishes and you just kind of live like we were talking about. You live life the way it comes to you. Well, Paul tells the Corinthian church here, run the race so that you could obtain first prize, first place. You know, in in our day today, when you think about about the Olympic Games, for example, uh, which Paul was actually using because um, just outside of Corinth, um, they, they had a similar practice to our Olympics today just a lot more basic than what we would see today. And, and they were known as the, the Isthmus Games. And, and they would be um, played right outside of the city of Corinth. And, and Paul was very familiar with this whole setup. And so, so he, something that was possibly a little bit different than our day today is in, in, our, in our Olympic Games, we have a, a gold medal, and we have a silver medal, and we have a bronze medal. And, um, and then there's even people, you know, when they place fourth or fifth, you know, you get certain points for that. Well, 
um, in this particular instance, Paul is saying here, I don't want you to try to get second or third or fourth. I don't want you to try to just cross the finish line. Because that's what a lot of Christians kind of get this mentality sometimes that it doesn't matter how I live my life as long as I cross the finish line. Now there's some truth to that, but if that is our motivation in life, and if you as a Christian are are looking at your life and you're like, you know, I don't really care if I don't bear fruit for the sake of the kingdom of God as long as I cross it, as long as I have my salvation intact, uh, I, I would really encourage you to ask yourself if you're in the faith. Remember, Scripture tells us to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. You see, when, when Christ dwells inside of our heart, there's a zeal that comes. There's a desire to become more like Him. In Proverbs 29, verse 18, we read, Where there is no vision, the people perish. And in the Amplified Version of that, it says, Where there is no vision, no revelation of God and His Word, the people are unrestrained. And so, the thought here is that when you aren't governed by purpose in your life, and your eyes aren't fixed on the prize, you kind of let yourself go. You're unrestrained. You, you just kind of live your life the way you want to live. And, you know, the picture I often get is maybe a picture you get. You know, you know when you see a really obese man or a really obese woman? And often, in their lifestyle, they've kind of let go. You know, sometimes they don't even comb their hair anymore. Um, they, they're quite disheveled in appearance. Um, sometimes you go to their house and their yard and everything is just kind of, um, you know, they, they don't cut their lawn anymore. Everything inside their house, it's all chaos. These are people that have just kind of let go. They don't care about their diet anymore. They don't care how many carbs they put in. Um, you know, they, they don't care about their appearance. They are just kind of living through life. And I'm not talking about people that have a health condition and can't help being obese, but I'm talking about people um, who have just kind of dropped everything. I kind of get this picture here um, in Proverbs 29, 18, when he says, when there, where there's no vision, they, people are kind of unrestrained. There's, there's nothing keeping them. There's nothing motivating them. There's nothing holding them. And the Christian ought not to be this way. And that's why Paul says, says here, there's a race that you ought to run. Run your race in such a way that you would obtain first place that you would obtain the prize. In in the Isthmus Games, for example, there wasn't a second, third, and fourth. There was only one winner. Only one person receives the prize. So so Paul says, "The, the aim in life for you ought to be that you would receive the prize. Because something changes in your mentality, in your way of living, when you're aiming for number one. When you're trying to get second place or third place or or tenth place, you live with a different mindset. And Paul says the Christian has the opportunity and should have this purpose in his heart, this this singular purpose to to have this goal in mind. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul confronts the Corinthians because they were living in complacency. They were living with this attitude of being unrestrained and just kind of letting things go. And he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1, he says, But I, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. He says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So he says, look at your life. You just kind of let go. You you were just happy that that you were saved and you never did anything else about it. In a sense, he was saying, "You, you, you you got to school, you came to your class, and and you are still in kindergarten. 
You're not passing the grade. You're, you're never advancing. You're never getting beyond. And so, Paul says, I couldn't even address you spiritually. Couldn't even talk to you about how you could run for the prize. How you could obtain the prize. Because you were in your infancy. All you could take was, all you could handle was milk. So, the thought here, when I look at this passage is, is God has a desire when we become saved that we would be purpose-driven people. That we would be goal-oriented. That we would be singularly focused. That, that our eyes would be fixed on the prize in such a way that we would have blinders on. And not get distracted by the things that are on the side. And so often we get distracted by those things. We, we have a goal in mind. And then all of a sudden we see our brother doing this or our friend doing this. And, and then we're, we're pulled away from our goals and our, and our purpose in life. And so, when your eye is fixed on the prize, you live your life a different way. You're not so easily distracted by the things around you. In verse 25 of this chapter, if you still have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 9, look at verse 25. He says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So again, Paul is, is taking us back to, to the games and, and to a race. And he's saying that when an athlete wants to get first place and his eyes are on the prize, he says an athlete recognizes something. He recognizes that he needs self-control in his life. But he says, this is an interesting thought, he says, you know, their, their motivation in life is to get to the podium, right? So, say for example, you think of our Winter Olympics, you think of a speed skater or something. And, and their goal is to, to put themselves under self-control to the degree that one day, one day, and it may take years and it may take take their third or fourth Olympics. But one day, the height of their, their, their aspiration in life is to be on the podium with the national anthem playing in the background and, and a flag being draped around them. And to, to the athlete, this is the height of success. This is everything to them. So they're going to live their entire life with that focus in mind. But he says, keep in mind that what they're striving for is a temporary goal. It's not really it. To them, it's it. But he says, this is what I want you to understand about that. This athlete is going to do everything he can, and his motivation is gold. His motivation is gold. He's going to do everything he can to get to that spot. But he says, I want you to put that aside for now and look at the Christian. Because the athlete is going to do that to receive something that, that is earthly. But guess what? As a Christian, we are also in a battle. We're also in a fight. And we're also in a race. But the Christian has a greater goal and a better goal. A better destiny because his prize is imperishable. It's never going to, to corrode. You know, moths won't destroy it. Thieves won't break in and steal it. This is it's never going to decay. Never going to rust. But he says, the Christian, just like the athlete, must do something. He must practice self-control and self-denial. Self-control and self-denial. I think these are often missing ingredients in the, in the Christian life in our world today. In uh, the Olympics that started way off in Greece back in ancient days, the Greek philosopher 
Epictetus, he said this. He says, do you wish to gain the prize at the Olympic Games? Consider the requisite preparations and the consequences. You must observe a strict regime. You must live on food, which is unpleasant. You must abstain from all delicacies. You must exercise yourself at the prescribed times in hot and cold. You must drink nothing cool. You must take no wine as usual. You must put yourself under a pugilist as you would under a physician and afterwards enter the lists. In other words, if you want to perform like a champion, you must practice like one. If you want to perform like a champion, you must practice like one. And, you know, one, one of the sad things is that often as believers, we, we want the glory, right? We want fame, we want position, we want prestige in life, right? And, and yet we don't want to practice discipline. We don't want to practice self-control. We want all the indulgences of life. And it's interesting that, that even here, um, people that were preparing for the Olympic Games way back in Greece, when these Olympic Games first started, they recognized that there was only one way for an athlete to get the prize, and it was through self-control. In, in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 9, if you go back a few verses to verse 19 there, I want you to see Paul's own example. It wasn't that he was just preaching a message and not living out that truth. He practiced these things in his own life. In verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this. He says, Though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Then in verse 23, this is a verse I have highlighted. It says, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. That I may share with them in its blessings. So, what is Paul saying here? I don't live my life unintentionally, he says. I don't live my life without purpose. In fact, I would have all kinds of liberties to do whatever I want to do. But there's... a uh, there's a, um, a motivation that's gripping my heart. And I see the gospel as being more important than anything else in this world. So he says, I, I'm willing to become a Jew to the Jew. I'm willing to become a Gentile to the Gentile. I'm, I'm willing to become all things to all people because there's a burning desire in my heart. The gospel is burning in my heart. I do it for the sake of the gospel. My desire is to, to just save some. If through my actions of self-control, through self-denial, if it will mean that now some people will be saved, I will come to the end of the road and I'll be like, it was worth it. Man, it was so worth it. When you receive the prize at the end of the road, and you hear, well done, the good and faithful servant, you'll look at your life and you'll say, I'm so glad I exercise self-control. Because as a result of my actions, people were saved. For all of eternity, they were saved. And in, in 1 Corinthians 8, I just want to read this portion as well. And he says, Food will not commend us to God, we are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours, this liberty, this freedom of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. 
thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if God, if therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. I want you guys to consider that thought. Because, you know, often, especially maybe in the wealth, health, prosperity movement of Christianity that we're seeing, um, uh, you know, branched off today in various places, you're seeing people that all they want to talk about is, is the liberty that we have in Christ, but they never want to talk about self-control. They never want to talk about self-denial. They never want to talk about exercising to win the prize. It's, it's a gospel that actually encourages letting go. You know, there's times where we let go and, and give our burdens to the Lord. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about that particular point. What I'm talking about is, is where people just kind of um, let, let their life go to the degree that wherever the wind blows, they go. And I, and I think this is, this is a fallacy that is being taught in so many circles. And it's contrary to what Paul does here. What if we would consider what the Apostle Paul considered? Because he recognized that around him, there were people that were at different stages in their Christian life. There were weak people that had come out of bondage. There were people that, that had served sin. And, and Paul, Paul recognized that, that some of these people who had come out of idolatry, for example, worshiping idols in, in some of these temples, uh, if they seen the Apostle Paul, and, you know, I don't think Paul was a wealthy man, but Paul knew that, I, that he could get a good piece of steak at the idol's temple. Now, he could afford it. He could get all the stuff for his smoker at the idol's temple. And he could afford it. And so, but he came to this conclusion. There's going to be people that are going to see me walk into that place. And though I have the liberty to do that, because under the sight of God, there's no such thing as an idol. It doesn't, you know, this comes from the Lord. Though I have the liberty to go into that idol's temple and buy that meat, and I'm not violating God, if somebody who came from that temple and they've now put it off and they're now coming to faith in Christ and they're just beginning to understand what it means to be a Christian, they see me go into that idol's temple to get my, my cuts of meat, they're going to they're gonna think that, oh, the Apostle Paul went in there? This man of God? So that means that I can worship God and and I can still go into the idol's temple and partake of the, the pleasures there. And so Paul says, I've come to a conclusion in my life that I won't even eat meat. That's an incredible thought. The delicacies that I would love to indulge in. Oh, how my body craves those things, right? I'd love to just eat that meat. He says, you know what? I will never eat meat again. If it's going to cause anyone to fall short of their faith in Christ. I, I think this is a missing principle sometimes in our life. I think we ought to ask ourselves sometimes, you know, in, in, in our day it's something different. In our day maybe, maybe the new believer sees the one that has liberty walking into the LCBO. Because he says, you know, I have no problem. I have the liberty to do this. And the alcoholic who has spent his entire life struggling sees the Christian doing this and may fall right back into his life of despair, depression, destruction, abuse, and everything else that comes into a family setting as a result. And Paul says, I'm not willing to do this. And so... He practices self-control in his life. He, he practices self-denial in his life. And these are, 
these are attributes that I think we sometimes forget are there. In Galatians chapter 5, 22, we're reminded that when people look at us, they ought to see the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, 22, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, is joy, is patience, or peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you ever notice that? That in, in the fruits of the Spirit, self-control is mentioned. When people look at your life, they ought to say, and, and be able to see what controls you. Are, are you controlled by lust? Are you controlled by anger? Are you controlled by indulging in the flesh? Are you controlled by alcohol or drugs or pornography or you name it? Your phone, your shows, your movies. Are you controlled by those things? There ought to be self-control evident in our life. A quiet spirit of denial. Others might be able to, but I cannot. So Paul says in verse 26, because I recognize those things, I do not run aimlessly. I don't run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. Again, he's, he's pointing back to, to probably an event in the games. Because a boxer needed to hit his opponent, right? What if a boxer just ends up beating the air? He's going to expend all his energy on nothing. And wastes his own time, his own energy. So Paul says, because I practice self-control in my life, and I deny myself certain things, I, I can now run my race with purpose. I don't run aimlessly. I live my life intentionally. This is very important for us to consider. We, we focus. When somebody is running with purpose, they focus on what's important in life. Remember, the athlete focuses on temporary things. But he still, he still practices self-control and self-denial. Because he wants to get to the podium. Well, the Christian doesn't run around aimlessly. Ought not to run aimlessly. Ought to have purpose in his life and he ought to focus on what's important. I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because the Apostle Paul gives us what our focal point ought to be in life. And it's contrary to how many, many of us, as we fall into the ruts of life, we, we sometimes let ourselves go and we don't really build. And Paul says, there's a way, there's a calling upon our lives that is unique and is God's will for us. In 1 Corinthians 3, 8, Paul says, he who plants and he who waters are one. But he says this, each will receive his wages according to his labor. Now, now let's just be very clear what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about salvation. We don't strain and, and discipline ourselves and practice self-control for salvation. Salvation is a free gift. We don't earn it. It's given to us. We take it by faith, believing that Christ did the work for us. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about the other side of salvation. For the Christian who is now in the faith. And he, asks, and he asks himself or herself, now that I believe in Jesus, what am I, what am I supposed to do? What, what should be characteristic of my life? And we all know that before Jesus ascended to heaven, he said to his followers, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is... It was not a message just for disciples. For those disciples, it was for all disciples. For all of us as believers. So, we are now saved. 
And so now we go to 1 Corinthians 3, 10, and it says, according, or verse 9, it says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. And so here's the exhortation to us. Let each one take care how he builds upon the foundation. And then notice what he says. No foundation. There's no foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, so, so Jesus Christ is the foundation. That's salvation. That's the foundation. But, Paul says, we as believers ought to take care how we're building upon this foundation. So he says, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, he says, guess what? There's coming a day where it's all going to be revealed. He says, each one's work will become manifest. That's what it means. It means that it's all going to be opened up. And everyone will see how you built on that foundation. Everyone will see it. It's going to be manifest. The day is going to disclose it. The fire is going to be put to our building material. And we're going to be able to see after the fire refines what we built with, it'll show whether we built with wood, hay, or stubble, or with precious stones. The fire is going to reveal that. And so, it says in verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So again, salvation is a free gift, but we ought not to be stuck like the Corinthians were, where they were stuck in kindergarten all of their life long, never advanced anywhere, never got beyond that, never did anything meaningful. They themselves may have been saved, but there was nothing, there was very little fruit. And when the fire tested it, it disappeared. You know, what I see sometimes in our world today is Christians are living this out on a daily basis because a lot of people have this mentality. You know what? I'm saved. I don't care about the rest of it. Let other people do the work. I'm just glad that when I die, I'm going to heaven. And they live their life in a complacent attitude, never progress. They're not purpose-driven in their Christian life. The, the issue, though, that I think we need to look at here is this was how Paul was observing the Corinthian church. But I, I really think that as, if we as believers look at a verse like 1 Corinthians 3.15 and we comfort ourselves with the fact that we're saved and we're, we're not willing to, to budge or get involved in, in, in pure Christian ministry with pure motives, I really think we ought to examine our faith. There's something very wrong with a person that says, my life doesn't really matter. I'm just glad I'm saved. I don't care what kind of work I do. The, the believer who's put his faith in Jesus has, has a zeal burning inside. A desire to fulfill the will of God. That's why what Jesus said, said that whoever loves me keeps my commandments. There's a difference in people who claim something but live differently. In verse 27 of um, this chapter here, 1 Corinthians 9, not only did Paul say that he practiced self-control, self-denial, willing to become all things to all people that he might win them, 
He, he recognized he was even willing to go to a degree further. And he says, I discipline my body and keep it under control. I discipline my body. I think we ought to look at that a little bit. You know, in the original Greek, the word there is, is hupo piazo, which uh, directly translated means under and to look at. Biblical scholars tell us that this term was used when describing how someone would beat themselves black and blue. To smite so as to cause bruises and livid spots. They, they said it's like a boxer who buffets his body and handles it roughly and disciplines it through hardships. You ever see somebody, somebody maybe especially an athlete, rigorously put them through things, put, put themselves through discipline? You know, because the athlete knows that when I put my body through tough things, it's actually going to help me and get me to a place where I want to be. I don't know if any of you guys go to the gym. Um, I go to the gym during the week, a couple of times a week. And, and you know, my, my, my goal is to, to try to um, take care of myself physically. I know it might not look like it, right? But I'm trying. Um, anyways, when I go to the gym, I see people doing crazy things to themselves, you know? Some people are really beating themselves up um, and, and just groaning and, and just trying to get to a place where they're content with their body. But they discipline themselves to get there. You know, um, even somebody who wants to lose weight, you diet yourself, you restrict yourself. Well, in this particular instance, Paul says that there's... There's a degree in the Christian life, there's a place that the Christian ought to find himself as he's, as he's moving towards getting first place, the prize, where he disciplines his body. His body doesn't, doesn't dictate to him how to fulfill his cravings. Because most of, you know, we all know that, right? You ever, you ever at 9 o'clock in the evening order pizza? <laughs> okay, some of you guys probably do. I've, I've done that in the past. I try not to do that anymore. But sometimes you're, you're really, really hungry. And all of a sudden, this cheesy, stretchy pizza with all the toppings comes into your mind, right? And you start to, to think about that. And, and then you start talking amongst yourselves. And, and then you discover this guy next to you also wants pizza, right? And, and before you know it, you've picked up the phone and you ordered pizza. So, but when you think about that, we, we often allow our cravings to dictate to us what we ought to do. But Paul says here, I don't do that. I discipline myself. I discipline myself. I put my body under subjection, under control. This is, this is what I find interesting, and this is what I'm observing today in Christianity. There's a disconnect here. Because Paul says the athlete knows what he has to do to get to the finish line, to get to the podium. So our secular world knows they have to deny themselves to achieve a prize. So they discipline themselves. When the guys go out for pizza and wings, or, or they go to the coffee shop for donuts, what does the athlete do? The athlete says, ah, that's not going to work for me. I have to trim down another 10 pounds in order to, to be where my coach says I need to be so that I can practice. So, so, so the athlete says, you guys can go, but I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to deny myself. I can't, I can't be eating donuts and pizza. I can't do what you do. I'm going to restrict myself. And besides that, you're going to get home late and I need to be in bed at 9.30 so that I can get up at 5.30 and I can get through my exercise routine and, and, uh, and win. So the, this is what I find interesting. The, the secular world understands these things. But, but in our modernized view of Christianity, 
We, we, we preach this and, and, and talk about this and sometimes say things like this. Oh, you know, Christ set you free. You have liberty. Do whatever you want to do. Live life however you want to live. This is sometimes the message we get. Maybe that's not even the message that's said. But sometimes as we filter these things through our own mind, in our own hearts, we're kind of thinking, yeah, you know, I have all this liberty. I'm just going to let go. I'm going to order, spiritually speaking, I'm going to order the pizza with extra cheese. I don't care what it does to me. And, and I just find that, that far too often the Christian lives his life thinking, you know, I've got liberty to do whatever I want to do without realizing that he's dropping in the race. Some of his liberties are making him fall behind. There's no way he's getting first place anymore. There's no way that that prize is becoming further in the distance. Because he knows inside there's uncontrollable appetites he's not willing to restrict. There's cravings that he's not doing anything about. You know, some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you ladies know exactly what I'm talking about. You have a craving inside of you. You have an uncontrollable desire that ought not to be named among the Christian faith. And so, instead of restricting your appetite, you indulge. And you hope no one's just going to see you. No one's going to look. And so you indulge in your appetites instead of doing what Paul said. Paul says, I discipline myself. And, and so one, some of the disciplines that we, we ought to practice, which changes our focus in life, are, is even like a quiet time of prayer with the Lord. I want to ask you, as you start your new year, how is your quiet time? How are you connecting with Jesus? Can you restrict your, your cravings, your worldly appetites to the point where, where Jesus and spending time with him becomes your priority? How about the study of the Word of God? You know, I, I started my one-year Bible reading plan again, and I kind of timed myself. It takes me like 15 minutes or less to read through the portion of Scripture if I want to read the Bible in one year. That sure isn't very much compared to the hours that God gives me every day. You can read through the Bible in one year, but not only that, you don't have to read through it and, and just check it off. You can study it. Maybe your 15 minutes becomes half an hour. But when you restrict yourself, and like the person that says, I'm not going to eat donuts or pizza because, because I'm, I'm looking at the prize, I want to get to the podium, the Christian says, well, others may watch movies. Others may spend their time um, you know, in, in sports, and I'm not saying sports necessarily is wrong, but it is wrong when it becomes out of balance in our life. So others may do those things. Others may, may live their life on a plane where all they do is compare themselves to, uh, to each other instead of looking to the Lord. Others may not restrict their appetites. But the Christian, who has his eyes on the prize, he looks at his life and he evaluates how he's going to do things. Like Paul did. He said, I might never eat meat again. I'm going to live my life so intentionally that nobody will get tripped up because of my life. And so he says, I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to practice spiritual disciplines, maybe fasting. You know, in the last year, how many of you have fasted? Fasting is a great way to get rid of those, those cravings and those appetites that take over in our life. Whatever they may be. Fasting is good, fitting, and right. It helps us. Are you practicing disciplines? Other people might not, but don't look at other people. Keep your eyes on the prize. Put blinders on if you need to. Spiritually speaking, even. 
and, and focus on the prize in such a way that you would obtain it, like Paul says. Practice these things. Witnessing, sharing the gospel is a great spiritual discipline. And then he wraps up this thought here in verse 27. He says, I do all these things. I discipline myself. I, I put my body under control like an athlete does. And I'm, I'm running to obtain that prize. He says, and, and the, the, the desire there, he says, I do these things lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So what is he saying? He says, I care about my testimony. I care about my testimony. I don't want to live my life in such a way that I disqualify my own testimony. So I'm willing to practice these truths in my life so that I may become all things to all people because my desire is to win them over with the gospel. And so, as I was thinking about this, I was, I was thinking, how, how do people disqualify themselves? He says, he says, I don't want to disqualify myself. And I was thinking of this picture he's giving with the athlete. We know that an athlete disqualifies himself through a few different ways. But one of them is through cheating. You ever opened up a news article and, and, and all of a sudden you've seen this guy that won gold was stripped of his medal because all of a sudden they discovered through testing that he'd been using performance-enhancing drugs or, or um, yeah, some kind of steroid or something, some kind of banned substance that he wasn't supposed to use. And they discovered it, and now he's stripped of his medal. Well, in the Christian life, we can also cheat. And I, I believe one of the ways we cheat is by thinking that somehow we can live a parallel um, Christian life in a, in a lifestyle of sin, side by side. And we think that we are fine as long as nobody sees us without realizing that everything's manifest to the, to the Lord. God sees it all. Without changing the way we do things, without putting any disciplines in our life to change things, we, we run through our life thinking we're going to cheat our way in. And maybe God never really has a hold of our heart. So we can disqualify ourselves by cheating. In 1 Corinthians 11, we see that God judged the, the Corinthian church harshly because this was their mindset. Remember, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, I couldn't even give you guys meat. I had to just feed you with milk. You were infants. You were, you were babes. You never, you never progressed in your life. You never, you never passed the grade. And, and so in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, after communion, Paul says, hey, guess you, 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 there's something going on here. There's people getting sick here. There's people that have fallen asleep. And, and we know that to mean that there's people that died. They were taken out early. They were, they were taken out of the race before they advanced too far. They disqualified themselves. And so, Paul said, I discipline myself so I don't become a statistic. I discipline myself. The second way we disqualify ourselves is by indulging in reckless behavior. In some ways, it's, it's, like, it's like cheating. But I think in another way, maybe it's not even living a lifestyle of sin. But maybe it's never exercising our gifts. Never really taking the great commission that Jesus gave us seriously. Maybe that's what it is in your life. Maybe you have been a Christian for many years. But when you actually think about this foundation of Jesus Christ and where you built, you actually realize that, you know, it's probably, probably really is just wood, hay, or stubble. 
there probably is nothing meaningful that I have built upon. You know, in actuality, maybe as you evaluate, you're like, almost everything I did, you know, I did it with selfish motivations. All I, I did it for the eyes of people. I went through the motions of life for the eyes of people. And I, I believe we disqualify ourselves when we live our life with this, this reckless behavior, this complacent spirit, because we all know that complacent, complacency leads to idleness. And idleness leads to temptation. And temptation leads to destruction and sin. And so in our day today, just like in the New Testament uh, where it was said of people like this that they had a form of godliness uh, but there was no power there. And that's, and Paul said, you know, Paul wanted to make sure that when people would look at his testimony, he didn't want to disqualify himself. He wanted people to be able to see Christ in every fiber of his being. So that's why he practiced self-denial and self-control and that's why he disciplined himself. So that there would not be just this form of godliness. But that people would see the power in his life. That people would see the reality in his life. That people would see Jesus in every area of his life. And then lastly, um, I think of an athlete can disqualify himself. Maybe just to go back a little bit. Um, as, as you think about living this reckless behavior, um, the, the way I was seeing that in an athlete's life is, is when an athlete doesn't care about himself, um, he lets go, right? He goes out for pizza and donuts. And as a result, he's a little too big. And now he experiences knee problems and he pulls a hamstring or a quad and he disqualifies himself from the race because his body wasn't in the shape that it should have been in. And, and that's where I think what happens when we live a life of compromise. When, when the test comes, we fail the test. When God sends someone our way and he wants us to preach the gospel to them, our testimony is so damaged, it, it has no weight. And that's why I think it's so important for us to, to not live our life uh, without purpose and without goals in our life. And then, then let's get into to this part about quitting. Most of you guys, as you look around you today, you know of, of brothers and sisters and friends and family members who have walked away from the faith. They don't serve the Lord anymore. They don't, they don't fellowship with believers on Sunday. They, they're pursuing wickedness and, and other things. Their priorities are elsewhere. They've kind of quit. We, dis, we disqualify. And, and in, in the, the world of Olympics, and there's many athletes that quit, that throw in the towel, that give up. They're not willing to discipline and practice self-denial and self-control. So they quit. Well, there's a verse in First John 2, verse 19. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they all are not of us. I think today there's many people that profess to be Christians. But like he says here, They went out, that it might become plain to everyone that they were never actually in the faith. There's a lot of people that for many years claimed to love Jesus. But where, when the, the rubber meets the road, where, when life actually became difficult, and where Jesus should have been real to them, they were, nope, that's not what I signed up for. They came for all the benefits, but not the reality of the Christian life. And so, many people today that you see around you that have quit. There's probably good evidence in their life that they never really knew Jesus. And in, in, uh, as we wrap up here, I just want to share Hebrews 10 to 39 yet. 
It says, we, brothers and sisters, are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are not like that. We are not of the kind of people that quit when the going gets rough. When Jesus dwells inside of us, there's an ember that never dies. Yeah, I, we go through valleys in life and difficult thing, seasons and stuff. But that fire will never go out. You know why? Because Jesus is putting oil on the flame continuously. It can't go out. And when we think about some of these things, I want you to think of the Apostle Paul sitting in a Roman prison waiting to be executed. And I believe he knew that he was going to be beheaded for the sake of Christ. And so in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he evaluates his life and his race and he says, I have fought the good fight. Wouldn't it be great if we could come to the end of our life like the Apostle Paul and we could say, you know, my life was characterized by discipline, by self-control, by self-denial. I disciplined myself. Others didn't and disqualified themselves. But I did because I ran my race so to obtain it. And that's what Paul says here. He says, I fought that good fight. I finished the race. Not just across the finish line. I ran for first place. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. I didn't quit. Henceforth, because of this, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Many don't love his appearing. But to us who have our bags packed, some of us are eagerly waiting for the trumpet to sound, right? I hope all of us. And, and you know what? We don't care if the trumpet sounds today because we are ready. We can say with the Apostle Paul, yeah, I fought a good fight. Oh, I messed up sometimes. But I kept the faith. I hit the finish line. I finished the race that God gave me to do. And I am waiting for that crown of righteousness. Are you? Amen. Songwriter says this. I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't care if they remember me, only Jesus. And I, I've only got one life to live. I'll let every second point to him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we are blessed as we look at the Apostle Paul's life, Lord. And there's something inside of us as a born-again Christian that says, Lord, here I am, here am I, Lord. And, and, and we cry out to you today, Lord, would you give us the strength, the power, the courage, Lord, the willingness to be intentional about our Christian life and ministry. Lord, others may. Others may not discipline themselves. Others may not run to obtain, Lord. But we want to, Lord, because you have inspired us to do that, Lord. You have, you have shown us in your word that, that we ought to practice self-control and self-denial. And that, that because the Spirit resides in us, these things ought to come naturally, Lord. We ought not to be craving and giving in to our uncontrolled appetites, Lord. Father, may we with fervency and faith discipline ourselves lest we should be disqualified. Father, give us victory. Give us a willingness, Lord. Give us the courage to build upon this foundation precious stones, Lord, that when the fire tests it, Lord, it will remain. That we will be able to to hear like the Apostle Paul did or to just experience that thought. Henceforth, there's a crown of righteousness waiting for me, Lord. 
Father, inspire us as a church in the beginning of the year to move in that direction collectively, Lord. Give us the willingness, Lord, to be everything you have called us to. In Jesus' name, amen.